This video contains spoilers for the Indigo Disc, watch at your own risk. Hello, Pokemon Masters, Buggy Butobi here, and welcome to my last Pokemon theory. That's not to say this will be the last theory you'll see on the channel. There are six more videos coming before the end of the year, at least. Uh, that's providing that I don't find anything else in the Indigo Disc that's just of particular interest to me. But this is kind of my last original theory, and it's one you've heard me reference a bunch, and you've seen earlier versions of the theory, but now I want to put into it more detail than I ever have before, because there is a lot of convincing evidence for it, and that is the Arceus theory. So, we're going to start off, as all good research projects do, with our good friend over here, Wikipedia. And if you search the word Arceus, it's spelt a little differently, but you recognize that as the name of the Pokemon, right? Arceus. Well, it's where Arceus uh, gets its name, as well as obviously being Arc from Archangel, and Arceus, uh, I guess, comes from here. It's a term in alchemy. And the Arceus is made up of four main, uh, what you would call, ethers. And the words that Wikipedia suggest, uh, the ethers that make up this, this Arceus, are chemical, life, light, and reflective. And those of you who have been following the channel for a while will know that I believe these to refer to different Pokemon, different legendary Pokemon that we've got over the last couple of generations. So let's start with what we know about the kind of creation mythos of Pokemon. We know that at the very top of it all, we have Arceus the creator god Pokemon. We also know that there are some adjacent Pokemon. We've got uh, Dialga, master of time, Palkia, master of space, and uh, obviously you can kind of see here, I've got some other assets relating to different things. So Arceus in its current form, as a Pokemon, as this kind of white equine creature bound by a golden ring encrusted in jade. There's a bunch of symbolism going on here already. Jade is um, within Japanese mythology. It's a gemstone that represents divine creation. So there is something divine about the creation even of Arceus. And Arceus in Pokemon Legends Arceus, there is a point where it mentions that it's taken this form. This is a form that it has chosen to take. I think that the thing around it, the Golden Band, is a godly restraint that allows it to take the form of Pokemon and uh, a Pokemon and exist within the reality of the Pokemon world. Without that, it is just this golden light, this formless thing that at the very beginning of Legends Arceus says, I am the one that you humans called, call Arceus. And we know this is a restraint because in the anime, we see that Dialga and Palkia, when they wear the red chain, it takes the form of this around them, binding them. Type Null, a Pokemon designed to look like Arceus, is bound by a similar kind of ring. Um, and of course, Palkia and Dialga in their origin forms, as we now know them to be, um, also are bound with these kind of rings that are stopping them from achieving some form of godliness, some form of beyondness. Giratina then just represents the kind of opposite opposite of creation. It is, it's part of the creation trio, but it's the kind of anti-reality, anti-matter thing. We also know that Arceus is not in its complete form because it separated itself into parts. There are the Arceus plates that exist across the Pokemon world, each infused with the energy of slain giants um, and different energy types. So what about this Arceus concept, the four Pokemon? And you can see here the tip of a Kyurem's wing. Is Kyurem one of these? No. Curin represents simply draconic energy. It is part, of course, of the original dragon. And this image here shouldn't even really be Curin. It should be the original dragon, but we don't know what that looks like yet. Dragon is important. You can see that, of course, all three of these little sort of minor creations of Arceus, minor creations, time and space, it's only a little bit, um, represent dra their dragon type Pokemon. Why? Why dragon? Why is dragon the unifier behind bet between these kind of cosmological beings? And if you, again, if you've ever watched a Loxian video, you know that dragon is the most sort of significant, it's the most special of the types of Pokemon that exist. And all four Pokemon that in my mind represent life, light, chemical, and reflective are all dragon type Pokemon. So Zygarde from Pokemon X and Y, Necrozma from Pokemon Sun and Moon, Eternatus from Pokemon Sword and Shield, and Terrapagos from Pokemon, whatever the latest ones are, Scarlet and Violet. <laughs> right, you might think, hang on, this last one's not a dragon type, it's every type. Terrapagos represents every single type. It is, it's got some dragon in there, um, and that's fine for me. You might go through and be like, hang, I, wait, hang on, okay, life, 
Zygarde is the master of the life death trio. That makes sense because Xerneas and Evelto, life energy, light, obviously, with <laughs> Necrozma. Reflective, yeah, I can see that with Terrapagos because of the reflective crystals that are a huge part of its being. Everything is reflective. Uh, but chemical for Eternatus? Well, Eternatus is also part poison type. Why? I actually don't know. Maybe Loxton did a video on that at some point, but I really don't know why Eternatus is poison and how chemical might tie into that. Maybe you might just think, no, look, there's too many weak links here. And here's what I'm going to say is as I go through this and point out the bits of evidence that kind of connect these four Pokemon, with each and every single one, there is a weaker strand somewhere in there. But there's so many similarities, I think it's somewhat intentional. For example, do you know all these Pokemon have ties to space? This is the Anastar City Sundial, uh, which is a meteorite that came from space. Here we go. Let me just make sure I've got it on screen. This is the 10 uh, carat hill in the Alola region where you find Necrozma in Sun and Moon, a crash site for Necrozma. Necrozma's Pokedex entry talk, talks about how it fall, fell down to Earth. Um, Kyurem is the same. It talks about how it came from space. There's the giant chasm. Uh, there's the Dynamax uh, Max Raid Lair, where there's said to be a giant meteorite in the, en in the middle, exuding the energy that kind of gives power to these... Uh, these Pokemon turning them into Dynamax, and then of course there's Area Zero. Uh, you might think, yeah, but hang on, is Zygarde related to this? Well, again, Zygarde's key energy is that of life and death, and when it opens its more, by the way, when you see inside its, its kind of carapace, there are these gemstones that are, I think, white, blue, red, orange, and purple, and they represent life energy generally, which is, I guess, Mega Evolution, and then Xerneas, Evaldal, Sogaleo, and Lunala. Again, it's interesting to know that Zygarde did not get a Pokemon Z version. X and Y just happened and there was no follow-up. Its story was kind of awkwardly crammed into Pokemon Sun and Moon, and I think the cancellation, I think it's pretty good evidence to suggest there was a Pokemon Z game in development. I think the cancellation of that game kind of meant that we didn't get all of Zygarde's story there. Um, perhaps it's somehow reflected in Guzzlord, which has definitely come from space and is an alternate dimension version of Zygarde. I've talked about that in other videos. They, If you look at their designs, they're both, you know, giant dragon Pokemon that are found in the same locations, areas that look the same. Doesn't matter. Not important right now. Um, you'll notice that all of these Pokemon are not in their complete forms. All of these Pokemon, uh, when you first encounter them, are, you know, it's a 50% Zygarde. Sogoel and Lunar are without Necrozma. It's only when they're combined together they become the Ultra Necrozma. Only once all of Zygarde cells are together, it becomes perfect Zygarde. It'll only be when Reshiram, Zekrom, and Kurama combined will get the original dragon. We've not seen that yet. We've only seen them half combined with um, Black Kurum and White Kurum. Eternatus only once it's in, sort of reabsorbed all of the Eternamax, uh, Gigantamax energy out there, does it become the Eternamax Eternatus. And Terrapagos, only once it terrestrializes as the Stellar type, does it become the, the Stellar uh, Terrapagos. So all of these Pokemon, that, that, that is a shared trait amongst them, uh, which is just particularly interesting. Um, and of course, for Dialga and Palkia, they're a little bit different. They just need their kind of adamant and lustrous orbs, but they need them like a certain size of that orb, because I think the old orbs from Diamond and Pearl don't work. It's only the sort of newer ones, which I think are called spheres, which are much larger. Um, that allowed for that that kind of transformation each one of them their body has been split into stone that empowers a particular kind of transformation um, Again Zygarde you might be like hang on how is its body split into stone? Well Zygarde's interesting because it represents the earth It represents the order of earth and earth is a celestial body as much as anything else um, But mega evolution of course it takes the form of crystallized stones the um, it, it, you know channel the life energy that Zygarde is the master of and I think in the anime specifically, the Anastar City Sundial is the Megalith, which specifically has like additional ties to Zygarde that we didn't get in the games. Again, maybe because we didn't get Pokemon Z. Um, obviously, we see in... Oh, sorry, I'm not keeping it all off camera here. Um, we see the Z crystals, which come from Eternatus's body. Not Eternatus. Uh, there's a lot of Pokemon here. Necrozma's body. Um, and also, its body itself is made up of these kind of golden accents that bind together the light. Um, the black and white stone are representative of the stones of Zekrom and Reshiram. That's less important because Kyurem is only really here to represent the dragon energy that the others 
come from. Eternatus' body is split up into wishing stars and the combination of, of that uh, with the Dynaban, meaning that humans can Dynamax and Gigantamax. And then the Terra Orbs, and then of course the Terra Crowns have the little face of Terrapagos in them. We know that that's the face of Terrapagos because stellar type Pokemon, when they um, Terrastalize, have a whole Terrapagos on their head, implying the idea that Terrapagos, from where it lay lays in uh, Area Zero, can see everything else going on in the Pokemon world. Perhaps the Terra Crowns take the forms they do based on what Terrapagos has witnessed, which is why Steel-type is a giant axe and the Ground-type is a giant Colosseum-y, um, uh, stadium-y place. Uh, okay, so these phenomenons. We've got Mega Evolution, which changes the shape of the Pokemon and powers it up. Z-moves, which amplify the power of the Pokemon, and Totem Pokemon, which uh, are, are the size of the Pokemon, so we've got changing uh, shape and power. It's separated in this case. Again, no two are the same. I've put Reggie Drago here. This is not... It's just Dragon Energy, but we know Dragon Energy was once a crystallized thing because Reggie Drago has Pokedex entry talking about how uh, it was once um, crystallized Dragon Energy. We have Gigantamax Pokemon, which of course changes the shape and power of the Pokemon and size. Uh, and um, I mean, all Terrestrial Pokemon change their shape and change their form by wearing crowns. But in particular with Ogapon, you even have like additional forms. So it definitely has the capacity for that. This is a little bonus one I've never thought about before today. Um, thought about this while I was on the toilet thinking, <laughs> I wonder if there's anything else for this theory. Carbink? Carbink? What about Carbink? But well, Carbink is a Pokemon that we know that Deancey looks like the Anastar City Sundial. It's the same uh, shape. It's also the only Kalos Pokemon that can achieve Mega Evolution. You can find it in Reflection Cave around where the ultimate weapon is. And it's just this little one-stage floaty spherical Pokemon that's somehow related to the phenomena of the region. Mini or two. It represents in all its different colors the refraction of light. Um, and in its shiny, it looks a lot like the colors of Necrozma. Uh, for, of course, the latest generation, we have Glamora. So, and we know that Glamora's got ties to um, Area Zero and to possibly the Trassel tree down below. What about, hang on, is this another weak link? Yeah, it is. It's a slightly weaker link, which is Stonjourna. Wasn't sure about this one. Was also thinking about Toxel, a Pokemon that has very a very special relationship to the Galar region and like there's depictions of giant toxicity and would tie into that that chemical element more um but we don't really know about that Stonjourna is bigger than the others that might tie into the fact that it's the region of Dynamax and Gigantamax energy but in fact even Kyurem has one of these Kragonal, which in the movie we see working alongside Kyurem. We know Kragonal is important. In the Crown Tundra, in order to unlock Reggie uh, Lecky or Reggie Drago's chamber, you have to actually... Oh, no, maybe it's Reg Isis, I suppose. You have to have a Kragonal. Kragonal, all of these Pokemon. Other than, again, weakling constant journey, maybe there's a better candidate that I haven't thought about. Like maybe Meltan, even? I just don't know. Um, you'd have to let me know. You'll have to continue theorizing without me when I'm gone. And I mentioned trees earlier. Each of them has a tree associated. So we have the um, Hoenn tree that AZ planted um, that has grown and AZ's Floet's flower can be seen. You can barely see it here, but it can be seen right here in the bottom in the bottom corner, AZ's Floet's flower. Um, this tree is outside the Cave of Origin where this energy is particularly strong. However, maybe a tree is the wrong thing. Maybe we should just be looking at the ultimate weapon itself, which takes the form of a giant crystal plant. The uh, battle tree which is a ginormous totem-sized tree. I say totem-sized. The idea is it's just become bigger in the, in the same kind of way. A uh, tree that, where, where battles take place. I haven't got anything for Kyurem. And again, that's fine because Kyurem is different. Um, we've got the Dino Tree. And actually in the very back of the Crown Tundra, right at the top of the Crown Tundra where Calyrex is, there's another tree. So what's the special symbolism here? We're not sure. We don't know anything about this tree down in the bottom of Area Zero yet. But each one has a special significant tree um and i get that's just that's just really interesting to me so this is kind of the, the the bottom here and you'll notice before i get into gen 3 and 2 that there was a special tree in legends arceus in which cleavor was at the front of and cleavor is here fueled by the power of arceus directly a light energy that makes it become bigger and stronger these noble pokemon so you can see how all of these phenomenons tie back to Arceus in that way as well. And I just think that's super duper interesting. We've got generations 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 covered. What about 1, 2, 3? Well, isn't that the question? 
three, I mean, we've seen an Auras Rayquaza, and maybe Rayquaza is tied into this somehow in a way that I don't quite understand. Um, and there certainly is some symbolism going on that I don't understand. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit of a, in a little moment. Um, but we do have gemstones, you know, associated with that in the red and blue orb. Um, so I don't quite know how it ties into this because it's not like Rayquaza is the master of its own phenomenon. They're just kind of weather deities. But again, maybe something I'm, I'm missing here. And the other one, Gen 2. Yeah, Gen 2 we have the least idea about. Could be to do with Lugia, could be to do with ho could be to do with Celebi. I suspect if we see a Legends Johto game or a remake game in the future, this will get answered because you'll have noticed that while Groudon and Kyogre have their origin forms and the Algar and Palkia have their origin forms, or sorry, primal forms for um, Groudon and Kyogre, and uh, Kyurem has two different forms for Zekrom and Reshiram, and uh, Sogaleo and Lunala have fusion forms with Kyurem, and uh, Zeshin and Zabazenta have active and inactive forms, and Groudon and Rhydon have loads of different forms depending on how many sandwiches they've eaten, and uh, again, weak link with Kalos here, surprise, surprise, um, Xerneas and Yveltal have an active and an inactive form when it's when Xerneas is sleeping as a tree and when Eveltal is the cocoon of destruction. The only box legendaries that don't have new forms are Lugia and ho -Oh, so I expect they're due soon. And Generation 1, and I think how that ties in is is pretty obvious. I've always theorized that they re Mew represents the kind of first biological life form on from the deities, on from Uxie, Azel, and Mesprit, who represent willpower, knowledge, and spirit. And so that that's what Mew's kind of role is within this cosmology. It's the beginning of the tree of evolution. But the tree of legendary Pokemon, how does that all tie together? Well, this might be a pretty good start as to understanding. And I say start because I think we're going to be understanding pretty soon. Because we have just had, and again, this is where you might be like, Toby, you are off on one here. But we have just had Hydraplin. Hydraplin? Hydrapple. A seven-headed serpent that comes from an apple. Apples have a lot of religious uh, significance, but most famously, you're probably familiar with the apple of the tree of knowledge. And it's all about trees. The seven-headed dragon, seven-headed serpent, it's dragon type. Seven dragons, one, two, three, four. Kyurem, five. Diaga, Palkia, six, seven. Maybe Kyurem doesn't count because it's the source of dragon energy. Maybe Giratina counts. Maybe Rayquaza counts. I'm not really sure. Maybe there's some symbolism here, like I say, that I don't quite understand. But this is where I'd recommend looking into um, the works of on Twitter. I truly recommend looking at the Twitter of uh, Eduardo uh, Nintensoku, who talks a lot about this, the religious tree of life, um, the tree of knowledge, the tree of life. Um, I think this is Hebrew. But I'm honestly not sure. I'm really ignorant on this particular thing and how it ties in with multiple different Pokemon. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that is beyond my understanding, but is well within the understanding of, uh, like, Loxton. He's done a lot of videos on this, I think, with help from Eduardo as well, about how these Pokemon all tie together. But it is very specifically a tree of life. But now we have the knowledge, which is the apple, of the seven-headed dragon and we're about to come up to generation 10 the 30th anniversary over a thousand pokemon and we have i think now now we've completed the arceus with reflective i think we have our seven heads of the dragon so i think what we see next that that's what whether it's gen 10 or what comes just after gen 10 is going to be the kind of big shift in the pokemon cosmology oh, i think we're going to learn something new about the pokemon universe perhaps finally we'll get more resolution on this talk of gi giants which i just think We've had so many references to giants over the last few generations. Again, Mega Evolution, I mean, Zygarde itself is a giant. Totem Pokemon, the giants whose energy made the plates, uh, Gigantamax Pokemon. Generally, the idea that the Paldea region is a giant Terrapagos or the giant inside the Oni Mountain. In the Crown Tundra, there was a Regigigas that was sleeping under the giant's foot. Like, I think there's a lot of ways. Uh, heck, even the Noble Pokemon are giant. Did you see that, Avalog? <laughs> So I wonder if that's the next frontier, the thing they've been building up to. Now, I, I want to put a little caveat here because there is something else. It is totally possible that this Pokemon theory is nonsense. It is totally possible that I am huffing the most copium possible because I don't want to admit the fact that Pokemon just might be 
kind of bad at telling big cosmological stories that it's just not their forte. That they sort of came up once of the idea of there being a legendary trio whose leader came from space that represents the dragon type that is responsible for the phenomenon of that local region, and that this trend, this pattern, isn't because they're all parts of something that are tying together, that light, life, chemical, and reflective don't reflect these Pokemon at all, but in fact, the just Pokemon's just kind of lazy with telling stories. That's also totally possible. <laughs> That all of these that I'm tying together are coincidences from a Pokedex of over a thousand Pokemon from stones that are like, you know, it's a classic thing of any fiction. The, the Chaos Emeralds, the Dragon Balls, the stones are just kind of a thing that they throw in there as the MacGuffin of every generation. That these transformations are nothing more than gimmicks to sell you stuff. That's totally possible. By, by the way, if you do want to see a video though, deep diving into the lore of the stones, I did a video on that. Link will be somewhere around the screen. Um, it's totally possible that that's just the case, that this is all just copium. I won't be around long enough on this platform to know, because I'm about to go on a big break for a while, and by the time I come back, this might all be answered. Or perhaps we'll be on to the next generation of the dragon that's fallen from space. Or maybe I just don't know how to count. Maybe there are still three more dragons to go, representing three different ethers. I guess it's going to be hard to debunk until we're another nine generations along, you know? Well, another four generations along, but still, that'll be a while. Actually, four generations is only like a decade and a bit, so I'll only be 40-something by then. <laughs> Though, is the tree of legendary Pokemon life at its beginning? Maybe this is a theory you, as a Pokemon theorist, will continue. I would love to see more Pokemon theorists pop up in the community. There are so many fantastic theorists. Where do I even begin in shouting them all out? You've got Hybrid Hero and SB Juju. You've got Dusty Gogo, Kayla's Capsule, Lumio's Post, uh, Soul Silver on, on Twitter. Eduardo, of course, who's not really a theorist, but it's someone you should just follow on Twitter. I'm going to leave a link to all of these people and probably more in the comment section down below. I just can't think of everyone off the top of my head. If you like Pokemon theories, if you like thinking about the Pokemon world in this way, if this enriches your enjoyment, as it has done mine of the Pokemon world for the last several generations, then please consider following them and subscribing. Also, while you're down there, make sure to pick up your Tree of Evolutionary Life poster. My merch store will only be open for two more weeks, as will this channel. I have six more videos coming, unless I discover anything new in the Indigo disc, but I'm pretty happy with the lineup of videos I've got, so unless something huge comes along, I'll probably just have the six more over the next two weeks. I think the day that the last video will be live on this channel will be December 29th, possibly December 30th. So thank you all so much for watching. Good luck out there with your theorizing, and of course... So hi, Pokemon Masters. Hello there, it's me, Professor Oak. This video is over, so please choose another one wisely and quickly. Bye-bye. Thank you anyone who has ever contributed through Patreon, and especially the big patrons of this month, Lucas Gates, Anthony Lee, Charmander Anzibal, White Zedek, Immortal Absol, and Jed Rubin. Thank you for your incredible support.